Welcome back to another edition of the Friday Golf Podcast. Today, we are going to talk about the Olympics, uh, the men's competition that wrapped up on Sunday. It was a scintillating tournament. It was, uh, it was really awesome. Uh, I think everybody had high hopes for the Olympics and it delivered. I am joined today by Joseph Lamagna and then Sean Martin will be joining to talk about the Olympics. But first, we're going to do our in and out uh, segment. Joseph, what are you in on? Andy, I am in on the Wyndham Clark redemption story or, or partial redemption story. There was a lot of Wyndham Clark hate coming into the Paris Olympics. I think that was exacerbated by people kind of knowing that he wasn't the strongest course fit. He's been really struggling this year, but Wyndham Clark qualified. <laughs> he wasn't picked. This wasn't a boys club type thing. Wyndham Clark has accomplished a lot on the golf course in the last 15 months. U.S. Open champion last year. Like he deserved to be there. He opens with a 75, and that social was what media, everybody piled on. Everyone started piling on, right? Bryson tweeted that he'd love to be in Paris, but you know, he's cheering for Team USA. He tweeted that after round one, convenient time to tweet it, right? When everyone's going at Wyndham Clark, and then Wyndham turned it around, shot 68, 65, 65 to finish tied for 14th, beat a lot of good golfers. And I, I really enjoyed reading his quotes. I'm not sure if you looked through his transcript after he finished, but there was a question more or less to the effect of, I don't know if you saw any of the social media chatter, a lot of people saying that maybe you were distracted going to a lot of these events and the way you're, you're doing the Olympics. And Wyndham was like, look, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. I went to a lot of other events like the gymnastics and he, he went to track. He's like, this was an amazing experience and I have no regrets about the way I handled any of this. Like, I think he did a really good job of vindicating himself and I respect the grind to, to lock in after a bad first round and put up three good performances on a golf course that didn't suit him particularly well. I think there are a lot of people who just don't like Wyndham Clark and wanted to take a shot at him. And again, is he one of the best five players in the world? No, he's not playing like that, but he deserved to be there. And I think he vindicated himself. Yeah, I think the the year has been a tale of two halves of the year. He was great at the beginning of the year, you know? He was he, there were questions like is he the best player in the world at one point this year before Scotty went absolutely bananas. Um, you know, he almost won it at, at, at Sawgrass, a course that I would say doesn't really fit his his game well. Um, and I think like you know, Wyndham Clark I guess the one thing I do appreciate about Wyndham Clark in, in a larger scale is like, to me, he seems like he's himself. Um, he is very, uh, I, I think the right word to use here is, is genuine. Uh, there isn't, I think like the, the person that, that was, that everybody was clamoring to replace him. I don't, I think he's like pretty much the polar opposite of Bryson. Um, there's not, uh, you know, underlying motives to, you know, what he's doing. Like, you know, Bryson's not tweeting about, uh, congratulations, Sky Scheffler. What an amazing performance, you know, to win an American gold. You know, this was like, it was more of a, you know, there, there was definitely a cryptic, uh, undertone to when and, uh, why Bryson might have tweeted out that, that, uh, that message. It, it was probably directed at the fourth qualifier from the Americans who, you know, played a very bad first round. Um, so I, I agree. I'm, I'm generally in on, on Wyndham Clark and his performance there. Uh, I'm in, you know, this is, this is a greater, uh, I'm in on the Olympics. What a, what a, what a takeaway here. I'm in <laughs> on golf in the Olympics, but more, if I wanted to zero in, you know, the men's tournament, and we'll get into this, uh, on the pod was, was amazing. This is, I think, the biggest event in women's golf now. Um, and Bigger I'm the super, Solheim Cup? Yeah. I think it's the biggest event in women's golf, and I'm super excited for the women's event this week. Uh, you know, you have a lot, you have all the best players, all the best women really in the, in the world competing. And I think from the, the platform that the Olympics gives it, the passer, but the general passerby audience. Um, the general fan interest. My my neighbors are not golfers. On Saturday night, they were asking me what's going on in in men in the in the golf. What who's going to win? You know that that doesn't happen for any. You know, and I I don't I don't want to you know be dismissive of any women's tournament at this point. But 
That does not happen for any women's golf tournament at this point. It happens for one, the Olympics. The general sports fandom, the audience. Um, yesterday afternoon, my wife stopped by and was genuinely interested in what's going on in golf. I have done this now for almost nine years. I can tell you that that does not happen for the Masters. That does not happen for the U.S. Open. That does not happen for any golf tournament. It doesn't happen for the Ryder Cup. It happens for the Olympics because my wife, will is who's not a sports person, will watch Olympic sports because it's the part of this big festival uh, of the Olympics that that captures a non-sports interested audience. And that is an amazing thing for women's golf. It's an amazing thing for just golf in general is that general passerby. When you have passerbys, you have the ability to attract them and make them fans. And I think this is a huge moment. This might be like the moment that women's golf really, um, I don't want to say needs, but this could be a moment that we look back on years from now and say, you know what, the t- the 2024 Olympics were it. That was the jumping off point that that turned, you know, we see women's basketball having this moment. Um, the WNBA ratings have never been higher. Maybe this is the moment that that leads to the the really growth and and popularity that we've been waiting for for women's golf. Um, and and I can't wait for this tournament. I hope you're right. I'm really excited for this tournament, Andy. I thought it was really cool to see some of the quotes on the men's side. Shane Lowry said, the majors are up there, but the atmosphere this week is as good as any major that I've ever played. Uh, Alejandro Tosti, uh, you know, a fan favorite, had posted a video saying it's the biggest crowd he's ever played in front of. I really hope that energy is there for the women's game. The only question I even have is the rationale as to the order of the women's going after the men. I just hope that with the men's game being a little bigger, it doesn't take some of the oxygen out and that the women get the same turnout. I think it probably just worked better for the professional schedule to do it this way. But I I think there's maybe a case to be made that the other way around would elevate the women's game. Regardless, super excited. And I'm in on that too. All right. What are you out on? Totally different direction here. Just think it's an interesting story that, indirectly affects golf but there's a pretty controversial tax happening in the sports betting world that i think is interesting for people to to see but um big headlines around it like DraftKings is introducing this surcharge tax andy and, and basically the way it's working instead of offering fans like let's say to bet on either side of bears rounds to use a a shotgun start matchup like you have to risk $110 to win $100 they are implementing this tax where instead of changing the price you pay on the front if you win the bet they're they're taking like uh, a small fee out of your winnings and it's very clearly impacting customers to the point that I know that it's going to go into effect January 1st of 2025 but it's going to outrage customers so much that some people think that they're doing this on purpose to, to kind of spark some uh, uproars against the, the legislation and to get some fans on board with kind of punching back a little bit. We don't want to see money taken out of our winnings. Regardless, DraftKings is a partner of the PGA Tour. Sports betting is, is very relevant in professional golf. And I think people should be aware of some of the things that are happening, uh, some of the ways that customers are going to be impacted and some of the more predatory practices. I'm not sure if this would be described as predatory, but sports gambling is a huge subject that's going to ruin a lot of lives, a lot of young lives. And I I think it should be legal, but people should be aware of of how it works. And like some of these small things that it's already very difficult to win at sports betting, regardless of how it's marketed, things like this make it a lot harder. and, And that's not always, again, the way that the entire phenomenon is promoted. This is a, this is a page out of the Big Tech Playbook. Um, big Tech Playbook is hey, uh, get people hooked to your product and then change the rules. And this is this seems like a, a quintessential rule change. Where hey, this is the way sports betting works. You get paid. You you risk this much. You get paid this much. But now it's like oh, hold on. Not only are you bet are we betting against you, but like a small fee change tilts the odds in Huge. a in a in a major way and it's sad i i have uh 
you know, I've long compared this and I, you know, probably to the detriment of the health of our company, you know, for, in terms of advertisers, like there's been a lot of money to be made for, for sports media companies. And you see it with like ESPN, ESPN bet, you know, like they have their own betting thing, but like, to me, this has felt the whole time, like, like cigarette ads, like we are at some point going to look back on, on sports gambling and be like, remember when we allowed Joe, the, Joe Camel and allowed like, our, you know, sports betting to completely infiltrate our, our, our sport, like the sanctity of sports. And, you know, I don't want to be on my high horse here. I, this is not what it is. I'm fine with sports betting and we would like entertain, you know, having sports gambling advertisers, right? Like, it's not like a, you know, a, a, we would never do this thing, but like when you look back on like I was a kid that grew up with with cigarette advertising and it kind of got outlawed while I was a kid. And you think back to that time period, it was like we kind of woke up and we're like, why are we allowing this to happen to our our kids? Like the the gambling ads were were really targeted at kids like Joe Camel, uh, the Marlboro man. Like these are these are figures that as a kid you would look at and be like, that's cool. Um, and I think like the way that sports has happened, the sports gambling thing is like, you know, th- it's been really marketed as like gambling on sports is fun and cool. Um, and I think that's not necessarily like the best thing. And and as they continue to to the decks were already uh, leaning their way. And as they continue to put more more weight their way, I, I, I would say, is it really gambling or is it just you're just contributing money and again this is a tax i think it's a little potentially different in that again DraftKings and mm-hmm. i'm sure similar sports books may end up really being like, trying to advocate for their consumers here but regardless i i agree with you I, I think especially young people if you look at how prevalent sports betting is and like high schoolers now very well versed in what a spread is what money line like you can't escape looking at tickers now without seeing sports bets and the, the different odds associated with each game prop bets being shoved down your throat. Like there, I think people in sports need to understand the mechanics of, of how this works, especially if they're taking on partnerships, for example, like the PGA tour, right? Like there need to be executives who understand the way that it's impacting their fans, because if it does leave fans with a negative experience, those could, that, that could be detrimental to the long-term health not just of their consumers, but of their own sport if those people end up being disenfranchised. One thing I'm out on is golf's scheduling for this Olympics. Um, I think that when we zoom out and we think about this, like the men shouldn't be playing uh, the week after the Olympics because the women are on the stage. I think that it, I think it's, it's reasonable to ask professional golf every four years to take a three week break. I don't think there should be any events really scheduled around the Olympics, uh, any major tour, whether it's PGA tour, DP world tour or women's like, uh, the LPGA. I don't think that LPGA, you should have players playing in, in Portland, Oregon and trying to play for their status and then having to get on a plane and fly to France, miss out on like the opening weeks of the Olympics if they've qualified. And likewise with the men, I don't think there should be men that are having to get on the plane right after they played the Olympics and fly to Sedgefield, North Carolina, and have to go battle for their status on tour. I think this is ridiculous. Um, I think that like there is a... I understand it's an inconvenience, but when you're talking about the Olympics, the honor of representing your country, you shouldn't have the honor of representing representing your country pitted against your job status. And that's what both of these tours have done with their scheduling. So for a player like Sky Scheffler, it doesn't matter. But when you get down the list at like an Eric Van Royen or players like that, it matters greatly. And the vast majority of both of these fields these tournaments that are around it matter and they're drastically impacting their Olympic experience. And I know that this is legislating a, a, um, a change in schedule for a select few, 
But these are players that have achieved something that is a lifetime achievement playing the Olympics. And I don't think that the re- I think that this should be a collaborative understanding that the Olympics are going to be a huge, huge driver of interest in, in both sports, the overall sport. This should just be a three week hiatus. And I think that like we've seen hockey do this where, you know, if hockey intersects in into the Winter Olympics, there's a break. Like, it's not like they just keep going. You know, there's a break. Um, I think that this this should be instituted and should be a part of the part of the pro golf schedules is like, hey, we're going to take a break. I understand, like, maybe there's a couple select few Corn Ferry Tour players that qualify and maybe there is a tournament outside. Like, I can somewhat get on board with that. I would love to see, though, just a, a full three week stop. I don't have a lot to add. That was well said. I completely agree. I think some of it is just putting athletes' bodies in the best position to be successful. And flying from Paris to North Carolina is not putting the athlete's body in a way that... I mean, you you don't have time to get your body adjusted. You're not putting them in a position to be successful. And I think if golfers like an Eric Van Royen are saying to themselves, well, I didn't play super well at the Wyndham, but I was just coming off of the Olympics. Like That isn't great for the sport. So... I agree. I don't know what there's obviously business trade-offs, right? The NFL schedule isn't optimized for athletes performance. They're playing games overseas and then turning around and playing another game seven days later. But I'd love to see some kind of schedule accommodations made to elevate both the Olympics and the events that are around it. Yeah. I think this would be a hard conversation for the Olympics were every year. It's once every four years. It's like when you think about it in the grand scheme of things, it's the Olympics are asking, you know, the, the way I always would say, you know, I used to say this to to the CDGA who who struggles to get great venues for for their state AMs. And I think they have like unique situation where the Western AM takes a lot of like the best venues around Chicago. But I, I used to say to them, like, you know, like if you if you say, hey, we want one week of your calendar to a, a great club every uh, this year, one of 52 weeks. It's a hard conversation and they're probably going to say no. But it, if you say, hey, can you give us one week in the next 520 weeks? So one week in the next 10 years. What one week can you give us in the next 520? The conversation changes a lot. And I think like that's the thing when you look at this is the question isn't, you know, that this isn't this one year we need three weeks or you're 52. That's a hard conversation to have with both the LPGA and the PGA tour who are dealing with like a lot of players, a lot of sponsors and a lot of juggling of the schedule. It needs to be more viewed as, Hey, the Olympics, which is a a huge, you know, opportunity for us to grow our sports, to grow our fan bases, to grow our interest, the general interest in our sport. The Olympics requires three weeks out of the next 208 weeks. That is a lot easier way to frame and to work around creating schedule solutions. And I think that's that's the way they need to change. It's not it's an Olympic year. The Olympics happen every four years. And this is what we've done with our schedule over four years to accommodate that. With you. Um, all right. One way you talked about the body clock. I've been doing a lot of travel and uh, I got to say. The body clock stuff is real. Like I, I flew from Michigan back to to California. I was really gassed after this trip, and you know, eight o'clock rolls around, and I'm like, this, I, I am, I need to sleep. I've been, I was kind of sleep deprived just because of the hours of the day in Michigan and shooting photos and videography requires you to be up early and out late in Michigan. Um, but one thing that really helped me throughout the week, I brought it on uh, with me on the trip. Was my Good Walk coffee, Joseph? Are you you're a coffee guy? Are you drinking the Good Walk? I'm drinking the Good Walk. I get it shipped every couple of weeks. Have What's a your blend? Right now. I'm the light medium roast. So you go with the fried egg blend? Yeah, I go with the fried egg blend. I'm not even positive if I picked it, but if I had, that's the one that I would have gone with. Good Walk Coffee is our coffee partner. Uh, we have a couple of proprietary blends with them. We have the Shotgun Start Blend, which is a dark, medium dark roast, and the Fried Egg Blend, which is a, a light medium roast. Um, these are freshly roasted coffees. I mean, they are shipped 
pretty much like a week or two from from their roast date, which is really important with coffee. Like you're not going to get that nice like bloom in the coffee if you don't have fresh coffee. So these are high grade, high quality beans that are shipped. We I kind of selected these two blends. So if you got qualms with them, you can bring them up with me. Maybe you could say my my coffee taste is shit. Um, but I think they're really high quality stuff. Um, and I, if you use the promo code FRIEDEGG at checkout, you'll get 20% off your entire order. Um, one of the things that I think is great about this is starting a subscription. Um, that's the way we have it set up for all of our staff here. I now have, like, because of my travel schedule, a nice surplus of coffee. I just gave, you know, one of my neighbors just came back from a long trip and uh, he was drinking coffee. We were having a, a coffee while our kids were playing together uh, out, out in the neighborhood. And I was like, oh, let me go get you a bag of our coffee. I gave him a bag of our coffee um, because I have like a nice little surplus. When you do the subscription, you never run out of coffee. It's great. It's like having to get forgetting to get coffee when you make a grocery run. It's one of the worst things when you run out of coffee and you got to wait till the grocery store opens or go pay for coffee at a coffee shop. Um, so if you use this code fried egg at goodwalkcoffee.com, you'll save 30% on your first order and 10% on all future shipments with a subscription, 20% off uh, the first order with just the code. So go to goodwalkcoffee.com, check out our two blends. They are, uh, they're delicious and you know, kind of upgrade your morning coffee experience with that. All right, we're going to bring in Sean Martin from the PGA Tour. He is lead, comma, editorial, whatever that means. He, it means he's in charge of something. I know that. Um, Sean covered the uh, Olympics when it was in Japan four years ago. I think he covered this Olympics from his couch. Um, but Sean, uh, I would love to hear what was, you know, there was storylines galore in this Olympics. You had... You know, uh, there were so many stories. What was your favorite one on Sunday that you were kind of following? I think for a lot of this, it was the fans. I think the fans added so much. I think, you know, the first Olympics was kind of maybe a, a test run. Didn't quite get the field they wanted. Uh, Japan, a better field. Some guys knocked out because of COVID, notably Rom and Bryson. Um, but you really had a good competition, uh, but you just had no fans there. There was no energy. And I think Paris, you had the peak thus far of Olympic golf. You had a good field, you had a great leaderboard, and then you had the fans. Um, I saw some players compare it to a festival. Uh, the fans are going wild for Victor Perez. I think just the dynamic of having um, an interesting golf course, one that produces a lot of different outcomes. There were birdies we made and, and bogeys as well, and then fans to react to those shots. Uh, I think that was the big takeaway for me. I think with the the fans thing, the golf course lends itself well to fans as well with the finish with with 15, 16 and 18 all being in that one centralized area where they have, you know, it, it seems like big mounds around it. So you can watch a ton of golf. I mean, you can watch um, almost the entire finish of the golf tournament from from that central area. And I think that led to increased energy it had it gave the telecast like a place to show you know and and return to over and over again and where you had big groupings of fans i feel like you know we the sport we cover is like you know a uh, miles long of field and like you can catch it you know i think this is a uh, this is a, like a popular live pga tour thing you can catch either tour at a bad spot and be like look there's no fans there um, and I think you could have found spots that like golf national without fans, but having that central kind of meeting location, as you described it and players described as a festival that also aided that festival like environment. Uh, Joseph, what was your favorite story you were watching? I think Victor Perez charging up the leaderboard as the fans were going crazy for him. The local French fans singing, he was being serenaded to, I believe it's the French national anthem and just a really cool scene as he started stacking birdies on the back nine. He described being very emotional afterwards. Obviously he didn't finish on a podium, but he was close. He had a chance to, and he described, yeah, if there's a six to 12 year old impressionable young golfer out there who showed up to this event, it may show them that playing golf and playing at the Olympics amongst all the best athletes 
in the world is a possibility for them. I thought it was really cool. I thought he handled himself really well. The first tea scenes with Victor Perez were cool. That was just a really cool storyline from Thursday to Sunday that I was very into. I think, you know, this is one of the great things about the Olympics and having three places that are awarded medals. Um, I think, Sean, you were on, on, I believe we did a podcast after your Olympics experience four years ago. But this is very similar. Victor Perez was very similar to one of my favorites, the Silver Slovak, the Rory Sabatini story. Now, Victor Perez didn't end up with a with a with a medal to show for it, but it's so neat that you can have these Sunday charges. I think uh, you know Scheffler would be the person that had the Sunday charge and got the medal. But you can have this Sunday charge, and in most tournaments, you're just gaining you know some extra cash or some extra FedEx Cup points. Um, from the Sunday charge here, you can have a Sunday charge and there's a extraordinary reward at the end of the Sunday charge. If you've kept yourself, you know, within striking distance of, of that top three position. And like what I think makes the, made the Victor Perez dynamic was like, he was playing along and then those last four, it was like, Oh, this actually like really means something coming down the stretch. And you see how guys carry themselves and handle themselves, you know, when they seemingly are just kind of playing freewheeling, playing for nothing, but then get really in the mix at the end. And I think like we saw different outcomes. We saw, you know, like um, Rory kind of, I, I felt like had kind of something he got going. And I think there was a moment in time where he was like, I'm going for the gold and tried to hit that heroic shot. Um, not in and came up a, a club short, like you know, he was kind of in between clubs and he tried to hit it really close on, on, uh, on that was a 15 and uh, spun it back into the water, you know, where like Victor Perez, he had a really good look on 18, given how difficult that hole is, um, to make to make a, a, a birdie there and change it, uh, and and get on the on the podium. Um, I think my favorite story, you know, I think Tommy fleet was just an interesting character in terms of, of golf. Um, and this generation where he's, he's now like getting on being pretty relevant for 10 years without a lot of like landmark wins. He's had some really good European tour, DP world tour wins, but for how often he's in the mix, there weren't a lot of wins. And I think this tournament uh, is going to be remembered as maybe one that he he really played great. He really had an awesome Sunday. He he delivered. He hit shots. He got up and down. He made putts. Um, and he had a couple bad breaks. But, you know, this is the story of 2024. He just got beat by somebody that's playing at a different level than everyone else. And Scotty Scheffler. And Tommy Fleetwood, you know, the nice thing for Tommy Fleetwood, and I think this is the one of the things that makes this event super unique is that when you he walks away with a silver medal, um, adding to Great Britain's summer Olympics medal total, and you don't walk away probably feeling the same way as a second in a major championship where there's some sort of gratitude, some. Uh, feeling of accomplishment. And I think that's one of the neat things about the Olympics. So I think there's been a lot of debate about where does a gold medal stand in relation to the majors. Um, I still don't think that a gold medal has surpassed one of the majors, but I think the Olympics has the best second and third place finishes in golf. To me, I think a silver medal beats even a runner up at the Masters. It's a great showing. You can leave feeling very enthused about your game, but all it gets you is a return to Augusta National the next year. Whereas a silver medal, once every four years, you're an Olympic medalist. So I think, you know, we talk about, like you said, there's nothing else to play for coming down the stretch. You don't have to worry about protecting the points, let's say, or where you stand on different standings. It's only about that one week and you can, you know, kind of leave it all on the field, if you will. But I think we saw that, that I think the Olympics has the best second and third place finishes in golf or at least the best prize for finishing second and third. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I, um, I, I think that's, I mean, it's so, it's so neat. I mean, like, you know, you think about like 
what the the medal symbolizes and i think that is the aspect of the event i i um you know i think the the overall the overarching uh tone of of the week was that i think you know it, sean you hit on kind of the awkwardness of golf um kind of in the olympics with the co- with covid at um in tokyo where you know some guys weren't in i don't think the buy in was full did this feel like a, an arrival for the Olympics to you guys, Sean and Joseph? I'd say for me, like that, one of my biggest takeaways and having my notes was that this past week was a huge windfall for professional golf. And I don't think in professional golf, we've had a ton to get super excited about in 2024. There hasn't been a lot of progress on a deal. This is now an event that has kind of sprung up, not out of nowhere because it's been building, but sort of out of nowhere into prominence and that we have a huge event every four years to look forward to that I think there is total buy-in and the golfers who aren't bought in may just get left behind. Like I I think the event will exist and is bigger than any of the active players right now. So if they choose for whatever reason not to show up in 2028, the event will go on and be special without them. So I think this was a huge windfall for professional golf and something to be extremely excited about going forward. Did you feel similarly, Sean? Yeah, I was honestly surprised that the storyline of who will play and who will not play wasn't even really a storyline. There was some point this summer where I asked like, are we sure Scotty's playing and and Xander and everyone else? I mean, I guess Xander is defending champion was definitely, but you know, before 2016, especially, and even 2021 because of, of COVID, there was kind of that talk of like, it was a big deal when a big name said, I am playing the Olympics. I will definitely play. Um, there, no one even really had to say it out out loud. I don't remember players coming out and declaring they were going to play the Olympics. Just the qualifying field came out and all of those guys played. And I was wondering if they would because you had the Open, you had a week off, and then you had the Olympics. And so I could have seen some guys saying like, hey, I don't want to have to... I'm not going to go back and forth to the States. Um, I also don't want to stay in Europe for three weeks, so I'm not going to play the Olympics. But that really didn't happen. Everyone just kind of took a week off down in resorts around like Spain and Portugal and places like that, I think had a nice week together or with their families. And then they showed up to Paris ready to go. I mean, it shows uh, in a way that, that the idea of playing some part of the calendar in in Europe is feasible, especially this time of year. If you were going to pick a time of year to do it, July and August when, when kids are out of school would be the best way, best way to do it. Cause you can lump in a vacation. Um, you know, and and still get the the full experience. I I thought this was a a huge arrival for the Olympics um, and golf, and in particular men's golf. I want to be you know, I think it, that it has been a huge event for for the women since the inception. I think they've taken it you know very seriously. To me, this was the first year where the men were fully bought in, um, as you alluded to, Sean. Like, I I remember asking a similar question to a player. I was like, are you, are you going to play the Olympics? Are you going? And they were emphatically like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to the Olympics. Right. Um, and, and I think that that was like kind of the big change. Um, I, I, you know, you, Jason day talked about how, how much he regrets not playing the first one, you know? And I think that's one of the unique aspects of this event is that like your, your status and your, um, I guess your eligibility is not certain because of how stringent and difficult the qualifying uh, criteria is like being one of the four best Americans four years from now is really hard. Like for the guys, like any of the guys, even Scotty Scheffler um, to say like, Oh, I'll be back for LA. I'll be back for Riviera. That is not like being one of the two best players in your country from your country is so difficult. And I think that adds like a layer to the competition, it adds a significance, and and as this event continues to grow in popularity, I think and and history, I think it adds a significance of like, hey, I'm coming down the stretch, I'm going for a medal, and then in the back in the in the back of the head is like, I don't know if I'll ever be back here. Like, I think that is that one of the neat things about the every four years when you create that type of scarcity. It is a double-sided scarcity. It's not just I'm one of the best players in the world. I have to be clearly one of the best four or two players from my country and one of the best players in the world to qualify. 
And this only happens every four years. So I really probably am only going to get one shot. The realistic aspect of the Olympics is four players for those top, you know, 20 players. Like you probably only will get two or three shots at the Olympics at the most in your, in your lifetime. And, and for the Americans, it's, I think it's more like you're probably going to get one shot because I mean, is Xander the first repeat Olympic performer? There's a handful of guys who have played all three, but you're talking about like Ryan Fox from New Zealand. Yeah, um, or Rory from Ireland or Hideki from Japan, you know? Yeah. Like, it, it, I think, going, you know, some of the other countries that might be easier, but in the American vein, like, I don't think there, I think Xander might be the only repeat American performer. Yeah, you're going to, uh, Colin was also in 2021. Which, I mean, you're going to have to be, but again, you have to be a top 10 player in the world if you're an American, not for all four years, but once that four years swings around again, you're going to have to be in the, in the top 10 in the world. And to stay in the top 10 for, you know, four years um, or to be back four years later is a, a pretty impressive and, and not an easy uh, position. I, Andy, I, I think it's a great point and it kind of goes with some of the longevity talk that we've done recently on this podcast. If you can say you've won multiple medals. That's going to be something that, and as careers are getting shorter, that means that you've been relevant for at least four years, right? Playing well and then four years later. I I think it's going to be rare. And and that's going to be a subtle accomplishment that as we talk about medals stacking up, like where does that rank with a major championship win and all that? I, I think as a mark of longevity, participation in the Olympics is going to be a cool way to look at somebody's career. I think that way a lot about like Ryder Cup um, and on the international side, President's Cup appearances. When you scroll down and you see like all the years that they've been on a Ryder Cup team, when you start to see people that played in five Ryder Cups, it's like, whoa, that's a that's a crazy long career. Um, And I think, you know, even two, if you get two Olympics as an American, that is that you were you were a player for a long time because like it's just so hard to be one of the four the four best Americans especially now that everybody's going to be playing in this conceivably for the future um let's talk a little bit about the players and the performance um uh you know Scotty Scheffler's had like a crazy year i i don't want to be a prisoner of the moment but was this the most impressive final round of of the year from him or a most impressive round. The uh, the sixty three at the players is up there. I'm not being a homer, I promise. But you talk about fi- lowest final round by a champion. Just uh, just wait till wait till what he does at the ultimate prize with that three shot lead. He's that's the only thing really missing from his resume at this point. Um, but lowest final round in players history. He was five back uh, against a good leaderboard. Wyndham and Xander were up there. He'd been injured earlier in the week. Uh, and honestly, a lot of that player's performance, I think, just said so much about Scotty and um, his gift because he couldn't swing it the way he wanted because of the injury. And so he was really just creating shots with his hands, and which is very uh, it's antithetical to how the golf swing has been taught for a long time about using big muscles and minimizing the role of the hands. And um, so I think it just shows that kind of innate gift that Scotty has that was on display again Sunday in Paris. But I think the way he turned it on and I, I appreciated the way he talked about making the decision to be more aggressive. Um, I do think sometimes in this era of data in golf and I'm not knocking the data boys, um, you know, it's just about giving yourself the most chances, whether that be on a hole or in a week and then hoping the chips fall your way. So, you know, maybe pound, uh, middle of greens, don't be too aggressive and, and just give yourself as many birdie putts as possible. And Scotty talked about how when Rom was up by four, he made the conscious decision to be more aggressive and then he pulled it off. Um, and I thought that was just enlightening and then showed again, the skill of like when he wanted to turn it on, he turned it on and shot 29 on the back and, and won a gold medal. I'm not going to poo poo his performance. I, I thought the back nine at the masters was or his last like 11 holes at the masters on a very firm demanding setup where that tournament was up for grabs. And then he completely slammed the door. He, this was, this was obviously very impressive too, but I think the masters probably ranks a little higher for me. Yeah. Something I want to talk about Sean is, is what you, the aggressiveness. And I think, I think we've gotten to this state with, um, 
a lot of and I, I don't want to put put everybody under the blanket, but a lot of the data and analytics community is like you play the same way all the time. And like I've just always believed like you have to have a pulse as a player of of what's going on. Um, if you're down four and you've got nine holes to go, sure, I could make I could run in a bunch of 20 footers or I could miss my target five feet right, you know, four times in a row, uh, you know, and have right pins that, you know, I, I, I hit it closer than I expect to. But when you're Scotty Scheffler and you're playing really well, guess what? You're you're just your your potential miss radius is is very small. Um and I think he was in a spot where he was swinging really well and he he put his foot on the gas and and I think like I believe this is like if you want to win a lot of golf tournaments, if you want to win a lot of golf tournaments, you have to deviate and play differently than the rest of the the field, you know, and in an era where everybody plays safe, I think we saw Tommy Fleetwood play very safe on 18. He was protecting that that silver medal on 18. But in an era where everybody plays extremely cautious and safe, there is a lot of money left on the table if you're able to play aggressive and and um and pull it off. I think that is like one of the things that will change over the next five years is that there will be a zig back to players understanding, hey, this is a moment I can go take this and I'm going to play a little bit more aggressively, especially because understanding your own personal um dispersion patterns. Like when you're playing well, your dispersion's a lot tighter than when it isn't. Like I, I recently played a, a lot of golf last week and I played really well a few days. And, and those couple days that like I was swinging, my body was moving well. I made, I made sure my targets were a little tighter the day that I didn't feel good. And I, the swing didn't feel good. I, I played very conservatively. Like, I think that's where this is going to go uh, long term. And I think this might be, a moment where Scotty understands maybe what he can do when he needs to do it. And, and I think that is, is an important aspect of this whole um, performance here is going forward. How often do we see Scotty when he's right around the hunt, put the pedal to the metal and try and, and push it because he's been successful now doing so. It- it's also what he says is one of his skills. I we did a Q and A with him before the Players Championship this year, and I asked him, "What do you think separates you from the rest of your peers with ball striking? Your numbers are incredible. He's obviously the best iron player on the planet." Um, you know, I thought I might get a technical answer about um, club face rotation or something, and uh, instead he just really went to kind of course management and self management, and really knowing when to pick his spots and when he feels comfortable with a yardage and. Um, and wind and everything else, but he f- feels like it's a shot he can hit. He goes right at it, and then he is really good at knowing kind of when to back off and aim at the middle of the green if maybe he doesn't have a great yardage or he's between clubs. And so um, that is one of Scotty's skills, and it is, has allowed him to uh, separate himself. And another thing I find really interesting about him, and Joseph and I have talked about it, is he keeps leading um, the tour in greens and regulation like he has for the last three years. And there's not often, you know, your guy who leads in strokes gained approach isn't always leading in greens and regulation. Um, and I look back to, I always remember when I was growing up, Joe Durant, like always led greens and regulation, but it's cause he was just hitting it middle of the green all day. He wasn't a long hitter. He's hitting long irons in the middle of the green, not making, you know, a, a ton of birdies on longer courses, um, or just like how shorter hitters always led in driving accuracy. Um, but Scotty, like is both leading in strokes gained approach. So he's hitting it close, but he's also making sure to hit a ton of greens which isn't always the case and doing so at hard setups too right he's playing you know one of the harder schedules of the year of anyone so um i I just think scotty obviously he's got kind of that athleticism he's got the innate gift with his hands he's a great shot shaper but he also is just really good at picking his spots and maybe even more so sean the i think it's really impressive the way he ranks so highly in strokes gained around the green when he ranks Mm -hmm. so highly in Greens and regulation because those I mean, are a he little chipped bit in yesterday on the front nine. And look at all of his wins. There are hole outs in the final round. His first masters, his first players, uh, actually this year's players, he hold a wedge. A lot of his wins have hole outs from off the green in the final round. It's kind of crazy. 
Right. Like if you're hitting a bunch of greens, it is hard to rank high in strokes gained around the green because you're giving yourself fewer opportunities. Not like strokes gained per shot, but strokes gained around the green. It's unbelievable to see how well-rounded Scotty is that normally those guys who are at the top at strokes gained around the green are guys like a Kevin Na in his heyday where he was missing a lot of greens and giving himself a lot of opportunities. So I think it is a testament to just how well-rounded Scotty is. Joseph, what stands out to you about the way um, Scotty's able to kind of uh, move his way around the golf course strategically? Yeah, I I, I disagree a, a little bit with the, okay, now fully pedal down versus completely playing conservatively. Like, I, I don't think the way that golfers should play a golf course changes that radically with the situation. But where I do think it changes a lot, and this was... I think it's an underrated skill of players is to understand conditions and how that impacts their dispersion. And like you're saying, Andy, when you're really dialed or when you have a great number, understanding that your dispersion is going to be a little bit tighter. So this past weekend on Sunday at the golf national is pretty soft and there was almost no wind. Like that's an opportunity where you can be a little bit more aggressive because short siding yourself isn't going to be as big of a deal. And when you're not hitting it into a significant amount of wind, like your dispersion is going to be tighter. And I think that there are a lot of golfers who don't know how to adapt their strategies, even if it only has to be adjusted a little bit. I think Scotty and Ted Scott, uh, Ted Scott, his caddy, does understand this stuff very well. Scotty always gives him credit for it. I think they understand when they can press a little bit. So I think Scotty does a remarkable job of being hitting shots that are still relatively conservative. He birdied 16 par three to a tough pin, but... It, he's not just going directly at the pin. He's still aiming a little bit left and allowing it. If it doesn't cut, he's still fine. Like 18, he hit a pretty conservative shot into the into the green to make sure that he wasn't going to go in the water. Like, he does a really good job of picking his spots, as Sean said. So I don't think that it's like Scotty feels pedal down one day, conservative the next, but just understanding that middle ground, how the conditions impact it, that's an underrated skill that I think, I don't know if anybody's as good as Scotty is at that. It's an interesting contrast to Rory uh, from Sunday. You know, he said that he hit the shot he wanted into 15. He saw his two playing partners go long because they rode the wind. And he tried to, I think, go under the wind a little bit and it never caught any of it. And so it ended up short. So, you know, I'm not saying Rory McIlroy doesn't know how to read the wind, but he said that an improper judgment of the situation is what led to um, his ball in the water on 15. I think the other thing that can happen too with like the wind um, in particular, that shot and and what makes it so so tough. It seemed like he took a little off it. Um, when you take something off and you're playing downwind, the wind can knock it down. Like what makes you ride the wind is spin. So when you hit a shot hard, you know that 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 ball is going to carry with the wind more. When you hit something soft, like I've always found, like the hardest shots and. I, I, you know, in a moderate wind, I prefer to hit approach shots all day long into the wind because it's so much more predictable than when you're playing downwind, particularly with wedges and short irons. It's where you like, you just lose a lot of control of carry distance, especially if you're taking uh, yardage off a ball because that ball just doesn't spin as much. And I think that's probably what happened in, you know, describe in describing that is like, the wind just it's uh, carrying it and knocked it down a little because you know if you just think about the way the ball goes up if it's downwind it can get your trajectory knocked down um yeah i think you know like it go, we talk about how golf is is played so much between between your ears and this is the stuff that's between between your ears like to me like scotty is a savant in being able to read situations, lies, everything like the, the shots from the rough. Like I think like the chip ins, like all this stuff is having a supreme understanding of how the ball is going to react off the club face, reading lies. Like, you know, those shots on 17 and 18 out of the rough were incredible shots. They were, you know, there, I, I know Brandel, talked a lot and and I think this is a great point about his upright swing the benefits of an upright swing with rough but there's also a supreme understanding of what the ball's going to do and that could be partly Ted Scott too but this is this is like you know that's the that's the stuff like understanding how the ball's going to come out because if you if you misjudge it you can look like a fool 
it also streaks, speaks to the quality of his strike because the quickest way to get kind of an unpredictable uh, result from a shot, especially with wind and line and everything else, is to miss hit it. So not only is he hitting it solidly all the time, but he's also hitting it with consistent launch characteristics that he knows how it's going to respond to those different reactions. And, you know, his distance control is great, but the most important thing with good distance control is hitting it solidly. So there is a lot of that too, but I think it goes back again to like the physical, just he hits it so solidly and hits it so well that it's easier to predict. I'm not discounting what you said about him being a savant, but I think that makes it easier for him to also predict it when he's hitting it that well. All right, let's take a quick break to talk about uh, one of the coolest projects that I have seen. Um, He's become a friend of mine, Josh Pettit, who runs the Alistair McKenzie Institute. Uh, He produced a few years ago a wonderful book that we did a podcast on called The McKenzie Reader. He's got a new book um, that he's reproducing. He's reproducing the famous golf architecture book that was written by Alistair McKenzie. This was a book that Alistair McKenzie uh, used to give out to every club that he worked at. He would he would bring b- the book with him and hand out. It was really like a kind of partly a marketing tool. That's why a lot of architects back in the day wrote so much. It was a marketing tool. It was a way for them to get their thoughts out there. So these this is Alistair McKenzie's book that really details his thoughts on golf architecture. So what Josh has done is, you know, you get a lot of bad reprints. Like if you go on and buy this, it's it's kind of just a crappy version of the book, of the original book. The sketches won't be as beautiful or or show off as well. What golf uh, what what Josh Pettit has done here is he has reprinted the book. So he's done his own typesetting. He's reset the typesetting. It's uh, you know, manually. So he's like, you know, he's done the like this is painful work that he has done to like the paper sourcing like this high quality paper is going to like make the sketches really turn out great like you're going to see a higher quality sketch so he has he has reset this book and it, it is a beautiful beautiful addition to your library i have the mckenzie reader it is by far my favorite book that I have. Like I just love opening it, turning the page, reading it. Like it is a beautiful, beautiful book. So he has done this with golf architecture. Um, so he is doing a pre-order right now. And if you use the promo code fried egg, you save 10% off. The book is $120. Uh, it is a wonderful, wonderful book to have. Uh, it is a quintessential staple to your golf library. Uh, we have Yoke with Dokes coming out next week. One of the questions in in the Q and A was what what golf architecture book do you find yourself keep coming back to uh, over the years in your career? This was the answer. This was the book. So I would get your copy of this. It is a is a collector's item type book. Um, this is uh, an elegant version of golf architecture. So you use the promo code Fried Egg. You get ten percent off, and you go to golf Ar- uh, McKenzie the web. URL to get this is mckenzie.golf. That's mckenzie, M-A-C-K-E-N-Z-I-E dot golf. Mackenzie.golf and use the promo code fried egg for 10% off. Congrats to Josh. This is a beautiful piece of work. Does, does this make you feel differently about Scotty Scheffler's year at all? It does for me. I think going into this event, player of the year was pretty up for grabs. And and I don't know that it should be declared now, even though it kind of was on the telecast. I don't know if everyone caught that, but um, I kind of leaned Xander after he had two major wins. Now, I do think this changes the calculus quite a bit, especially because the Olympics have seemed to arrive in a big way that I don't know that it's necessary to say that they rank exactly with a major or or figure out exactly where it stands. But to me now, it's hard to look at Scotty's season and think that somebody had a better season with a gold medal to his name, especially Xander had a chance to win this and didn't get it done at all. It's it's very clear that Scotty Scheffler is the best player in the world. He has, I think, in 17 starts this year, he's finished outside the top 10 twice at Amex and at Pinehurst. 
Like it's just a remarkable season. And he again won this week, losing strokes putting. Like he's dominated. So to me, unless something crazy happens the rest of the year, which I, I don't think is really possible since I don't view the the FedEx Cup playoffs on anywhere near the stage that I view the Olympics or the majors. Sorry, Sean. Uh, I think it's I think Scotty Scheffler is probably going to be the player of the year unless something crazy happens. It's voted on by peers, too. And I just have a hard time believing in that that vein that the peers would in any way not vote Scotty at this point after what they've gone through. And there's two schools of thought with player of the year. There's either who was the best player week in, week out, or whose season would you rather have? And it can be different. The latter usually skews more towards major performance. Um, the other is more for just, you know, week in, week out, uh, counting, you know, regular event wins as well. I look back to like when Brooks and Rory were kind of the top two players for player of the year in 2019, Brooks had a major, um, but hadn't done a ton outside of that. Maybe had won one other event. And then Rory, you know, won the FedEx Cup, was really consistent, and the players voted on Rory. But I think with the gold medal now, Scotty checks both boxes. Week in, week out, he's been the best player. And I think you could argue that even though Xander has more majors, in some ways, I could see Scotty having the season that players would actually prefer to have. You have a major, you throw in a players, and then a gold medal I think, and more wins. And I think the whole of that and the variety of different kinds of titles that he won, especially with the gold being a pretty coveted prize now, I think, like Joseph said, I think that his season checks both boxes. So outside of Xander sweeping the FedEx Cup playoffs and winning all three events, I think it's Scotty's. Yeah, to me, I'm in the same boat. Uh, I'd love to disagree here, but I think like it was a... I kind of was looking at Xander's year with the two majors and being like, you know... Two majors, two drastically different courses. I know Scotty's won basically like everything for a little while. Like he went bananas um, on a lot of different golf courses. But this is the this is to me the cherry on the top. There's no way that any. I don't think. I mean, Xander, if he ran the table in the playoffs, like I just, I still don't think I would feel differently uh, about about. Um, their two seasons, even though that'd be crazy impressive and something we'd never seen before. I think I'd still feel the same way I feel now where Scotty has just, I mean, extraordinary, extraordinary year. And I think like, you know, when you, when you think about everything that has happened with Scotty Scheffler, it's, it's also impressive because he's handled, he's been able to handle the ascension and the fame that's come with his play. And you know, I think I think Detective Gillis probably played a part in in his popularity uh, increase. But I think the the thing it's impressive that he's been able. Like I think this is something that a lot of big players would agree is like challenging is getting used to being the guy. And he's carry he's taken it so in stride, and and the play has has just been been. Phenomenal. And this is just the latest example of, uh, you know, where I have to imagine if you're Tommy Fleetwood, Hideki, you kind of leave, leave this week really happy about your metal performances, but also scratching your head as to like, I can't believe that guy got me, you know, from where he was because it, it didn't look like he was going to win, um, or even potentially metal. And then all of a sudden in a flash, he he wins the, wins the golf tournament. Andy, a takeaway for me that I think kind of is tightly related to that. There's some debate, like did Tommy Fleetwood choke? Was this another situ- situation where Tommy Fleetwood didn't get it done? And I kind of have mixed feelings about that. But to me, the biggest takeaway is that Scotty Scheffler is playing. There's just a new level that we haven't seen anywhere recently that very few guys can actually access, that they can play that way for four days. And I think you made a great point following the masters Colin Morikawa more or less said Scotty's better than I am I think a lot of players in the locker room virtually everybody knows Scotty Scheffler is clearly the best player in the world I am not that and I I wonder if deep down how Xander Shoffley feels if he thinks that he's actually on Scotty Scheffler's level I I would find it hard to believe that there's anybody else on the planet who thinks they're on Scotty's level so I think this was the year I can see John Rahm thinking that but certainly hard the, to after yesterday, the gulf between John Rahm and Scotty Scheffler got a lot larger this year. So 
that to me is like 2024 is the year that Scotty Scheffler planted a flag and put a new baseline that we haven't seen in professional golf. And I think that's the biggest takeaway for me. Did Tommy Fleetwood like choke or not? He, uh, maybe he should have closed a little stronger, but he is not a, I thought he a player cl- he of the stature that. I, I he, like I struggle with this because like that up and down on 17 was really hard, but he birdied he, 16. The birdie on 16 was impressive. I think in calm conditions, playing the last five even just isn't going to get it done. Those are hard holes, but Scotty's just better. That, that like, That's yeah. that's where I land. It's not necessarily a choke, but he's just not good enough to beat a, a Scotty Scheffler who's in rhythm. Yeah, I feel like he got a really tough break on 14 too. That was the that was the difference when I when I think back and it, he might he probably chose the wrong club. He should have hit probably, a better shot. I well, I think he hit a really good shot. I think he they they hit the wrong club. They oh, I think sure. on the telecast they were saying he went down to a seven wood like he went back. And I think he, I mean the shot looked really good, but I you know, I was looking at seven wood 250 whatever and I was like oh, that's a big seven wood. Um and I, I think that was like a mere like I he didn't hit the right club. I think Faxon afterwards like Long's not bad here after he hit it, and and you know that's a situation where just kind of misplayed the situation um, rather than an execution error. That's the thing. I think like people, people, I feel like execution errors, and I think we can this can parlay uh, into the next discussion. Um, but execution errors are what you should be looking at when you when you feel like someone lets a tournament go. Um, you know, golf is extraordinarily hard, and I guess it could be some of this too. But like Fleetwood, you know, he missed a fairway on seventeen, and then he missed a green, which shouldn't be super. You know, it wasn't like it was a terrible swing. Either of them were terrible swings, and then he got a really tough break with where the ball ended up with that like thick rough behind him. And that made that up and down like impossible. If that ball's two inches the closer to the hole, I think that it's probably a simple up and down. If it goes into the thick rough, I think it's an easier up and down than what he was left. And then, you know, with 14, his ball not getting down into the bunker and staying on that lip, that was just, that was a really bad break. Um, and this is like part of what the difference of of golf tournaments a lot of times ends up being like you got to bounce here, you got to bounce here over seventy two holes, and like down the stretch winning time he got two kind of pretty shitty breaks, um, in terms of like how where his ball ended up, and I think that's the the difference. Like I think you add those two up, it probably equals a shot, um, in the grand scheme of things. Like he gets one of the two up and down if he gets to the bottom of the bunker or the or the you know, into one of the defined cuts of rough where he's not on the edge. Um, I think someone who just failed to execute down the stretch, two pl- players were John Rahm and Xander Shoffley. Uh, John Rahm has to be the biggest disappointment here. He had a four shot lead uh, standing on the 11th hole and he doesn't even end up on the medal stage. I thought this was a, an example of, of when you're playing for something that has substantial meaning. Um, and what can happen? Uh, I don't think this would happen at a, a at a live event. I don't think it would happen at a run of the mill PGA Tour event. And and this is why I th- I'm pretty confident associating a very high um, position for the Olympics in the pro golf hierarchy of great tournaments. Um, John Rahm just kind of just faded away, shot 39 on the back nine and, uh, and, and to go from 20 under and a four shot lead, looking like the tournament was over to a T five was, was shocking. I think this was the biggest shock of the, of the event. Uh, what'd you, what Joseph, what, what do you, how, how do you leave this, uh, tournament feeling about John Rom? Uh, I agree with, I agree with everything you said about this, his collapse kind of being validation of how special the event is because there are very few tournaments that can create that kind of intensity that it results in a meltdown. Separately, I leave feeling fine about John Rahm. I I think there's been a lot of overreactions to how bad of a year he's had. Like he really, uh, he's got a lot of stuff going on in his personal life. Aside, I, I know like his wife's going through a challenging pregnancy and he's had a couple kids change tours. 
he had two really bad events this year, the PGA and the Masters. And otherwise, I think if there were a major three weeks from now, John Rahm would be one of the favorites and deservedly. He'd be well behind Scotty. He'd be behind Xander. And after that, I think he and Rory would be pretty close. So I, I think John Rahm, especially in the last like month or so, has kind of reasserted that he's one of the top players in the game. But I fully agree with you that both he and Xander's collapses are a signal that this event meant something, especially with that particular golf course. It can result in some stressful shots and you see who has their game when there are shots under pressure. So I agree with everything you said, but still come away from it thinking like in 2025, John Rahm is going to be one of the the top five golfers in the world. I feel pretty confident in that. Where do you land, Sean? Rom on that front nine on Sunday looked like the guy from early 2023. And I think I wrote it a couple of times, just felt relentless, like just kept pounding greens and hitting them and giving him birdie opportunities and just kind of kept coming. Um, at the Masters that he won when he chased down Brooks, like Brooks sprinted out to that lead, but Rom just kept coming and eventually chased him down and passed him, you know, like a a strong finishing kick in a, you know, 1500 or whatever. And Scotty sort of did that today. But then Rom on the back nine, the interesting thing is the short putts and then the tee shots missing left. And um, that can be a swing thing, equipment thing, who I don't know. But in that span between the start of 2023, where uh, he won like four out of six or three out of five, and then he went through a lull and then he won the Masters, he kept missing left. Like when that power cut isn't cutting, he misses left. And that's what hurt him uh, off the tee Sunday. And that's what, you know, hurt him can hurt him at times i don't know the cause i know faxon mentioned an alignment issue that uh, rom and dave phillips had worked out so maybe that was it but um the other thing too i think is just how crazy things get on sunday and how many judgments we make from them like you look at xander and xander at wells fargo look like the xander that couldn't close will he ever close um gets it done lips it in at valhalla and squeaks by Bryson. And then a Troon looks like a killer. And we're like, this new Xander is here. Who's in unflappable um, is going to win five, six majors has figured it out. He's a force. And two weeks later, looks like the guy almost from Wells Fargo, where he just couldn't get it done on Sunday. So I do think there's more pressure. You know, it's harder to hit shots on the golf course and on the driving range. It's harder to hit good shots in a tournament versus a casual round. And so it's harder to hit good shots on Sunday versus Thursday. So there's some of that, but also golf too is just like this crazy game with wild variants and Sunday afternoon gets the most attention. And so what we see Sunday afternoon leads to the biggest judgments as it should. But Xander, I think it's just proof that storylines and narratives can just change so rapidly based on really only a handful of holes. A handful of holes and a handful of outcomes, mm-hmm. right? Like you think about like the number of times you have a chance to win over the course of your career is still, I would say, like I, you know, from my college st- statistics classes that are like, you know, decades away or dec- decades from now, uh, you know, like, you know, 15, 20 years now, um, they would, that's still like if you, I added up like the most prolific players of our generation or of, of any generation, that number of chances to win would still be a st- statistically irrelevant number. Right. Isn't it? What is it? Like 1600 or something is like the, the number that would say like you can determine if somebody's a clutch player. So I think that's it. One thing I, I loved, um, about you know you talked about Rom the relentlessness that word and I think we hadn't seen the relentlessness and I think like there's an aspect of Rom's game when he's clicking that I really admire and he kind of brings that uh, very few players I've seen bring there's a physicality to it like with his stature and the way he plays golf like I you know just the way you described it pounding fairways and greens like there is just like this there's a, a a presence that he has when he is when he is in the lead and i know like i it, i think that some of this has to do with his stature but like it, he feels like a bull you know in there and like you you can't move him off his position i thought it was just shocking to see him get into where he got and and for it to slip away and it may you know i i would I would venture I would agree that like there was like 
that I'm not worried about John Rahm next year. I think the the last couple of weeks have been like a very nice um, turnaround for a player that had a really rough start to his season um, with a lot going on in his life. I will say that I think there was an added weight to this tournament because I believe that that John Rahm and, and to probably a little bit lesser an extent, Rory McIlroy viewed this event as like, hey, this winning a gold medal would really redeem what, you know, was a disappointing year. You know, for Rory, I think the disappointment came with just, you know, you could just say Pinehurst. The disappointment of Pinehurst, the gold medal could save that. For Rom, it was everybody's talking about how lives changed me as a player. This is what can what can change the narrative on me. And I think it would have. I think if John Rahm walked away with a gold medal, it would be like John Rahm's back. Is he at the level of Scotty and Xander when he's cooking? That's what we would have been talking about on this podcast. And for 70 for 63 holes or 64 holes, you know, John Rahm was back and he looked like, you know, especially playing with Xander Shoffley, a different player than Xander Shoffley. He left him in the in the dust. And then it all came crashing down. So I think like, I think the takeaways for Rom, this is a really bad year, no matter what happens the rest of the year with live for him. Um, I think he's going to look back and say like, you do these career narratives when you look back on, on great careers from the eighties and nineties. And like a lot of times you'll see like there's one or two year gaps where they just weren't the same player. And I think we'll look back on this and be like, well, this is all, these are all the things that happened. He had a bunch of kids. Um, he went to live. And this year was one of the years that was like kind of a lost John, John Rahm year. You mentioned Rory and we talked about physicality and I was at Wells Fargo this year. And honestly, uh, Wells Fargo, when he went eight under on eight holes and lapped Xander felt like one of the most physically violent things I've seen on a golf course. Um, and it felt like old Rory. And I felt like we got glimpses of him this week. You remember he, you know, second shot in a par five, bounces off the flagstick, makes that run to start the back nine before hitting in the water. And I am kind of curious where Rory goes from here. He kind of took a shot at himself in his post round comments, saying he was the nearly man of the last three years, that he hasn't gotten it done. And um, he even kind of said that, you know, I'm tired of trying to take positives. I just want to win. And you know, Rory subscribes to that kind of growth mindset they talk a lot about in contemporary psychology where you try to endure the hardships by finding the positives. Like, yeah, I might have lost, but it's a learning experience and I can grow from this. And that's where the growth mindset comes from of like, these are all basically steps in the process to getting to where I want to go. Um, and it, it does probably help lessen the sting of um, of losses, which Rory has experienced recently. But even he kind of mentioned, it seems like I just need to care about winning now at this point. It's been enough close calls. You know, I'm sure he's done the mental inventory. He's learned all he's going to learn from these close calls. Like it seemed like he felt like now, like I just need to win and worry only about winning. I'm, I completely agree. I think pretty much every year after the last like six years, the spin at the end of Rory's major season has been like what he learned and why it's going to be different the next year. It's not the exact same thing, but I almost think it's kind of similar to players saying that they're not getting the, they're they're hitting the ball a lot better than the results they're getting. Like at some point you, you just have to do it. So in the same way that he's probably fatigued about talking about it, like I'm also a little fatigued about <clears throat> hearing about it and like it, it does just need to get the job done. So I, uh, I don't think that it's a negative. Like he's getting himself in the mix, but next year with Quail Hollow in the major rotation, like the, the noise is going to be loud, and Rory just needs to get one across the finish line. Yeah, I'd agree. I think, um, I think like the Pinehurst experience, it, and I think it was one that you can take away a lot of different things from. But I think the one thing that it. it it should have taken away was like, it was a, a, a Sunday where he made putts until he didn't, you know, um, which is, I think has been the problem. I think that was the big problem at St. Andrews and LACC was he just like made nothing. Um, and, and then this, this week, I think the takeaway is like, you know, Hey, like that quail hollow run can happen at, at a, at an event I care about. I don't, 
I don't mean to take a shot at the Wells Fargo, Here but that 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 uh, that run, that type of like um, explosiveness can happen at events that I care about. Um, is like if you have the positive takeaway, it's hard. I mean, this is this is why golf is so compelling because there's only one winner. And there's a, a slew of world class players attempting to win these events, and for the most part, and I think this is like the hard thing about about Rory's career, and maybe this is like where the where it's you know what makes it so compelling is like Rory didn't lose a lot early in his career, um, and as he's aged, as he's gained perspective, as he's become, our, I would say a better golfer he's lost more often like that. That's a hard thing to deal with. Like he's, he's had this frustration. I think he, I think almost everybody that has watched Rory McIlroy would believe that he's a better player now than in 2014, you know, more well-rounded has more shots, can play more golf courses. Well, but at the same, on the same token, he has lost maybe some of that, um, trying to think of the the, the the right the right word i think it's more like being naive i think like like when you don't lose as much like you don't like there's like an invincibility i mean, you think about tiger's like career he didn't lose ever and then he lost to y e yang and and like there's like a distinct difference and i you know the injuries and personal life stuff like kind of mounted up but like there's this whole I have like this whole like thought of like if he never loses to Y e. Yang, like does he does his career play out differently the rest of the way? And I think I believe yes. But like with Rory, like he's having to deal with this like I think like there's like the mindset thing is like you're having to deal with the knowing that you can lose when you play really well. And that's something that he didn't have early in his career. Where do you land, Sean? I think so. I mean, I think scar tissue is a thing. I think when you deal with a sport where like the minute changes and in, in like th- at impact in the milliseconds of impact lead to huge things. I always think of like players who talked about when they, would try to play conservatively, but they kind of knew the flag was over there and they'd kind of just leave the face open a little bit and, you know, hit it over there. Like um, the opposite, I think is true too. And you have that little bit of scar tissue of like, maybe you just kind of ease off it or just kind of aim away from that flag. And um, it's just such a mental game where the smallest things make such a big difference that the slightest shift in mindset, I think can have a huge change. And so I do think when you lose that kind of naivete where, you know, everything seems to be going your way. We saw it with Spieth as well, like 2015, nothing could go wrong. Everything went his way and then gets punched in the mouth at Augusta. And he won a major after that, but hasn't really been the same. Um, I think that that matters because, um, yeah, because of the huge impact that little things can have in this game. And, and I just want to read the Rory quote just so I'm accurately representing him. But this was after his round on Sunday. He said, I feel like I've been golf's nearly man for the last three years. It's all well and good saying I'm close and close and close. Once I actually step through the threshold and turn these near misses and close calls into wins, that's what I need to do. So um, it's interesting to see if maybe if he shifts his mindset away from kind of growth and learning towards just winning and getting the thing done. Maybe that's the change that's needed to capitalize on all these experiences that preceded this. All right. Uh, Let's uh, kind of wrap up here, but I, you know, to wrap up, I'd love to hear uh, one parting thought on the on the Olympics. One thing in your notebook that you hadn't got to, and then uh, and then we'll we'll close this out. You know, a family member of mine texted me this, and I thought it was a great point. Seeing Novak Djokovic win and express the emotion that he did, somebody who's accomplished everything you can in tennis almost indisputably the greatest tennis player of all time, at least in my mind as a casual tennis fan, saying it's probably the biggest success he's had in his sporting career, more or less saying that his career is complete. Just the range of emotions on display at the Olympics was a huge takeaway for me, very refreshing in the modern landscape, especially with what's happening in golf. Seeing Scotty Scheffler crying 
uh, as the United States national anthem was playing. This event, I'm, I'm so bullish on, and I think there's a a little thing I had in my notes of like, are we? How do we feel about Riviera and like what kind of crowds it's going to get? Like, I, my understanding is the Olympics in the United States is going to be a little more spread out, right? With sites and like soccer games in Dallas, and I really hope that they're able to get international fans packed at Riv as long as the fan presence is going to be there. There are not many events that I'm going to be as excited for as the Olympics moving forward. So I think just seeing that range of emotions has really made me feel something as a sports fan. And I'm just extremely excited about the future of this event. I think one unintended consequence, I don't think he did it for this reason, but I was thinking about Rory playing for Ireland instead of Great Britain. I think it means that he might even have two Olympics left in him. I don't know, you know, who knows how long he wants to play and play a full schedule to rack up world rankings, but being one of the top two players from Ireland, I feel like is something that he could hold for um, eight more years. And I think this week also, my main bigger point, uh, this was another week that kind of illustrated some of the genius of Scotty Scheffler. And it came about, I think, from Brendan Quinn of The Athletic, who sort of asked Scotty, what does this mean for your legacy? <laughs> and Scotty was like, I don't care about my legacy. You know, we're going to die. And in 30 years, no one's going to remember us. And uh, everyone kind of took that as this like nihilistic Nietzschean response. Um, but A, I think there's some truth to it. You know, try to name some major champions from 1963. Um, you probably can't. Some of us maybe can. I can't. Um, and I think that gives Scotty a freedom to, on Sunday, he's not thinking about what does this mean? What is it worth? I want to win this um, for, you know, other reasons besides... He just wants to win. And so I think he does this great job of balancing. He cares deeply about competing and winning, but doesn't care about it more than he needs to. He walks a really fine line between it's very important to him in the moment, and then it's also not important to him afterwards. And I think that helps him be the player he is. Yeah, I I, I think that's that's right. There's never... When you we talk about like how hard it is to win these types of events because of the history, but if you don't ascribe or associate any value to it, like if you think about like two players we talked about struggling down the stretch, uh, with Rory and Rom, I think they're two of the people that talk the most about history and and you know what know everything that certain players did. Like you know you you know Rom can just rattle off you know former major champs. Uh, same with Rory, um, you know, and you know, when you, I don't know if Scotty could do that. Scotty probably would just be like, uh, I don't, I don't know, you know? And I think that's like, actually like a, a super valuable thing is not knowing, um, in a way, because then it doesn't feel different than the heritage or the, you know, uh, you know, TPC Craig Ranch, right? Like that, that it doesn't feel different if you, if you don't ascribe a historical value or understand the context of something. So I think, I think you're spot on there. Uh, it's like another one of the, the, the mindset things about Scotty Scheffler that you look at and it's like, this is a big advantage. I think like the, one of the things that I, I just was, you know, we haven't touched on this surprisingly with, with Sean's Hideki stance and, and fandom. I think one of the cool things is like the disappointment of Hideki Matsuyama uh, last Olympics, um, not losing out on the bronze medal in his home country. Had a uh, six a footer on the final hole to get bronze alone in Japan. And the year he won think, the Masters. Yeah, you, you just think about like the the disappointment that that he you know probably stuck with him for a long time. Um, you know, I think when we look at Hideki's career, it's it's a super impressive one with the Masters, even like down to like the Zozo winning that in, in front of his home country. Um, and you think about like the redemption story. We just talked a little bit about how it's not guaranteed that you're going to be able to make it back to the stage, but to make it back the next Olympics and get the job done and get on that podium. And I think like the last, Five years of Hideki's career has been kind of weird. Um, he had that in, insane run in what was it, twenty eighteen? When I think seventeen he, going into eight, uh, seventeen going into eighteen, yeah, it was yeah. like that winter where he won four of six events that he played in, and you know it looked like he was the best player in the world, and and he hasn't been able to, for I think health reasons, uh, 
really be at the level that he could have been, but he looked really good out there this week. I I was like taken aback at some of the drives he hit. I think he was he was past Rory um on a drive that Faxon described as being pummeled. He was past um Xander the day before on a couple tee shots. And and to me, if Hideki has that in the tank can somehow get to a place where he's hitting the ball like that, you know, do we have a couple more years of him being an elite player? Because I think that's one of the things that like over the last three, four years has slipped is like Hideki isn't that first page player. Um, We see glimpses of it. We saw it at Riviera where it's like, oh, yeah, he is that guy still. But like there's been just kind of like an inconsistency. And I think a lot of it's health related. Yeah, I think the hard part, too, we don't really know when he's healthy and when he's not. He's not doing a ton of press conferences. He's not getting a lot of English language interviews. So it's just hard to know when he's healthy and when he's not and how much of the poor play is due to injury, you know, how long this stuff's been lingering. Um, But he, the guy's going to stop flying spirit. (laughs) Do you think he still is? Do you think he flew spirit to Paris? Do they go to Paris? He's got it. He's just got to take care of himself a little bit better. No comment from Smart. I, he's got, I mean, he's got to be a private jet at this point, right? The spirit thing was shocking, especially to LA from Columbus. Now, Columbus to LA, there's not a lot of options. Maybe some Southwest in there with a stop, go to Burbank or something. I don't know. But uh, I'd be curious to see, you know, what does he fly to Paris? Delta? Private? I don't know. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> um, Sean, big thanks for coming on. Do you have, you know, I want to let you leave as your, you know, your token for coming on and d- discussing golf with us. I want you to be able to leave, you know, what, what are we, what are we going to be excited about the next couple of weeks for the, for golf with golf, golf's ultimate prize on the table? What are, what are you watching? Comcast business class, top 10, just business top 10. I think, uh, Especially, personally, I love Memphis. I love Germantown. Uh, one of my favorite stops on tour. Uh, but really, Are I'm excited going for, to Memphis? Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm excited for BMW. Uh, Castle Pines, I think, will be a fun venue. It'll be unique. Um, I have a story coming out on kind of Wyndham Clark dominating junior golf there and kind of the phenom he was, which, you know, that's another player we didn't get into. It's probably some people owe Wyndham Clark some apologies after his first round. Um, um, admirable comeback in his last 54 holes at Paris. And then Atlanta, I was up at East Lake last week. I really like the redesign there. Are, it's a totally different look for East Lake. A lot of the corridors are the same, but the greens, the bunkers are totally different. Um, really enjoyed meeting Andrew green, talking to him. What a, a humble, gracious guy. Um, so I think those two things, and then just three tournaments where you have the best players in the world competing against each other. Um, I think are things worth, you know, worth watching. I think the big thing is, and I think we liked it about Scotty crying is we like to know that the golf means something to these guys besides just tons and tons of money, which obviously the money helps. Um, and I think the thing with the FedEx cup is, you know, there's obviously lots of opinion on formats, things like that. Like, I think it matters to the players. Scotty talked about it really, uh, affected him when he lost that six shot lead to Rory two years ago. And then, I think for Victor, it was kind of the biggest thing he'd done yet in his career. And like, I think for, it's like your year end um, performance review. Like, I think it matters to guys that like, it just validates the hard work, it validates a good season. And so I do think that matters um, to players. And so in that, I think the FedEx Cup has importance. There it is. You want want to end your year on a good note. If you've had a great season like Scotty, like if you're Scotty, you want to win that thing because you want to cap that year off on a great note. If you if you were the czar of the PGA Tour, how many shot lead would Scotty deserve for his year? Five? More, Joseph? Ten? I think there's only one right answer and it's zero, but go on. Go ahead. Okay. I I I just find it crazy that it, we can we're going to get to the end of this and and there's a real chance. I guess that's what's interesting. It's it, I, I'm actually more excited to watch than any year because I have this, you know, you know. I just want to see. I I want to see chaos at all times. And if if some 
some person, you know, if uh, if Wyndham Clark wins the FedEx Cup <laughs> and Scotty ends up like 10th on the end of year standings, it's going to be like, wait, what? What are we talking about here? <laughs> but that would make it, it, it exciting, you know? Chaos always makes for good television. All right, Sean, big thanks for coming on and talking about the Olympics. Uh, we'll look forward to the next couple of weeks and reading your writing, your dispatches from, from Memphis. Um, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you, guys. All right, Joseph, let's close with some recommendations. What do you got for me? This is going to be one that some people love and it may be a small percentage of the people who try it and some people are going to absolutely hate it there's this new game i've found on my phone that somebody sent me called contexto i don't know if you've heard of that it's similar to a new york times game one of those that there's like one puzzle a day free to play but the way it works is you're trying to guess the word of the day and with each word you input it gives you a similarity score like a natural language processing model. It gives you a similarity score to the word. So if it's stove and you pick the word cold, you won't get a super high score, but then you pick hot, you get a higher score and you start working your way up to the word. Very difficult, very frustrating, but I think for the right person, if you, if you like these kinds of word games, once you sort of crack it and, and you start playing once a day, I'm all in and it's, it's one thing every day that, I will not miss. So it's contexto.me is the URL. Um, I, I, I look forward to it every day. I find it very rewarding when you get the right word. So uh, some people will hate this. And, and if you want to give up right away, that's fine. But for the right person, I think it'll be a smash hit. I don't think that's me. I'm not going to be playing contexto. <laughs> that's fine. We won't be, we won't be, you won't be hearing from me about my contexto <laughs> um, troubles. This is for travelers. I've got a little tip for travelers. Um, I, I think the, the vast majority of people are flying coach, um, in, in economy or whatever you want, your airline calls it, uh, something that I've done recently. I, I sat, you know, I, I have uh status so I can book in like the premium economy, but if you want to have the most possible space in economy, the row for you is the second exit row. So the second exit row in a in a standard in your standard airplane is the best is the row that you have the best most amount of space. If you want the most amount of space, it's aisle. Like just in terms of like pure space, the aisle second exit row is the most amount. And the reason is those seats recline. So I'm more of a window seat guy, but for my long flights, I used to always prioritize being up near the front of the premium economy up near the front. Like you get off the plane faster, but when I'm doing these long trips, for the most part, I'm checking a bag. So I'm going to wait no matter what, when I get off the plane, what I've done is I have prioritized the space and I've been booking into the second exit row, my window seat, second exit row. It generally kind of fills up a little bit later than the, the forward window row window seats uh, in the premium economy. So I've been going that second exit row. I notice like I feel better getting off the plane because of all the like it's an insane amount of space. It is the most space you get uh non first class on a plane. So second exit row, window seat for me, but if you like like you like the aisle, that's where you're going to get the most space. Honestly, like I feel I like I know I've noticed that especially on long flights, the amount of space like I like my legs really can like can can breathe. So that's my tip as a experience. I know this is bad for me because these these might you have more demand, but that is like where you get the most space in terms of pure pure like numbers. Second exit row because then you get the real climb. As somebody who recently downloaded TikTok, Andy, all I can think about is like th this. Lends itself very well to an Andy's travel tips. I, I think there's a future for you in giving out some of your travel tips. Uh, again, you don't want to influence demand too much. Now it's going to be impossible to book one of those tickets, but I, I think you have a future in that. That could be a side hustle. 
As I listen, this I'm just trying to pass on some nuggets as I uh, as I think about like how I've been able to, like you know, it, it's increased my travel enjoyment uh, just a little bit. All right, that does it for this episode of the Friday Golf Podcast. Big thanks to PJ Clark for the editing and producing of this episode. As a reminder. We are humming in Club TFE. Uh, today, this is Monday, a new design notebook just went up uh, and involves a Q&A with a golf developer as well as Matt Ruches. You probably recognize that name who for- formerly produced this podcast. Now is kind of more moved into like a full-time uh, role of, of producing content for us, whether it's a lot of social stuff you'll see or, or written stuff. He... He went on a affordable um, Indiana golf trip, which is which is in in that design notebook. So if you want to check that out, uh, it's a great piece. But we do that weekly. We have weekly course profiles. I don't want to make any promises. I'm working on my my course profile for Oakland Hills South, a future future U.S. Open host. I'm about fifty percent of the way through that. Um, but check that out. Uh, it's one hundred and twenty dollars for the year. Uh, and it's a great way to support what we do here at Friday Golf. We'll be back on Thursday with uh, a new episode of the Oak with Doak. I was in Michigan. That's one of the reasons I was in Michigan last week recording with Tom. Um, we've got two new episodes of that coming out in the next two weeks. So that was fun. It was fun to hear all this going on in his life. He's very busy. He had three golf courses open this year, three golf courses that are under construction. Um, and really, you know, when you think about, uh, the time of his career, it's a, it's a legacy building time of a golf architect's career when you get to open this many new golf courses, because new golf courses are what, you know, you're going to remember. It's not going to be necessarily the restoration of this. It's the, the new golf, the golf courses that have your, your name on them. So cool time for a lot of golf architects. You think about core Crenshaw, Gil, Tom, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. There, there's so much work in the industry that a lot of these guys, you know, Rob Collins, uh, you know, uh, there, there are a lot of people getting a lot of opportunities to build new courses. And that's great for the golf course architecture space and, and the future of golf course architecture as a job. Um, you know, I think we went through a time where there was not that many jobs and, and not that much work in golf architecture. And right now we're in a boom and hopefully it sticks on, it holds on because it's uh, it's great for the you know there's more young people in that in that industry than ever before, and a lot of architects are getting a great opportunity to show what they can do in their creativity. So exciting chat with Tom, and we'll be back on Thursday with that episode.